All right. Hello. Hello and welcome to the Decisive Era's Hexagonal Table. <laughs> I'm Cameron Rudine. And I'm Adam Moran. Today we're going to be talking about some various eras from antiquity in the classical world. Mm -hmm. um, let's start off with probably the earliest recorded battle in detail, the Battle of Kadesh between the Egyptian New Kingdom and the Hittite Empire. Hittites certainly notable for being the first people to discover smelting mm -hmm. of iron ore. So the first, probably the first major power to have control in Anatolia and Turkey. Mm -hmm. Though Kadesh is mostly often considered to be the first battle in history. It's not actually the, f well, the first recorded battle. It's actually not the first recorded battle. That mm -hmm. would be the Battle of Megiddo. Rather, it's the first recorded peace treaty, although the peace treaty itself wasn't signed till the Eternal Treaty, which was about five years post-battle. Mm -hmm. With, and it was actually signed with this the Hittite king, Muatali II, who actually fought at the battle. It was fought with his, it was signed, rather, with his successor. Yes. So, because he had, he had died already. <laughs> All right. But, uh, yeah. You ready to run the clip? Um, for, I guess, first, before we'll run a, we'll run a documentary, and then we'll discuss it afterwards. Sounds good. All right. All right, run that clip. Kadesh, modern-day Syria. This is the site of the first battle in history to be recorded in great detail. Over 3,000 years ago, in 1274 BCE, over 45,000 men from the Egyptian New Kingdom and Hittite Empire would fight for control of the nearby settlement at Kadesh. At stake was control of the Levant and Syria. Now prepare to witness the Battle of Kadesh as Ramses the Great and Muatali II fight for control of Syria. See the vast numbers of soldiers, their formations, and the context and history of the engagement. Now, on Decisive Era. To see how this battle came to take place, we must go back to the early 15th century BCE, the Late Bronze Age. The Late Bronze Age in many ways resembled our modern day, as large powers competed with one another for dominance while still trading and relying on each other for resources. Syria at the time was filled with minor city-states, and the initial great powers to compete over were Egypt and Mitanni. After recently pushing out the Hyksos, Egypt sought to create a buffer region of vassal states to prevent another invasion. The pharaoh, Tutmosis III, would subjugate many city-states, including Kadesh. The kingdom of Mitanni could not afford to fight with Egypt and the rising Hittite Empire in Anatolia, and so peace would be made with the pharaoh. Relative regional peace would be made in Syria for the next century, and Egypt would benefit greatly from the trade and wealth brought in through its vassal states in Syria and Palestine. However, by the mid to late 14th century BCE, the pharaoh Akhenaten had pulled back troops from Syria to help control Egypt and enforce its new religious policy. In 1344 BCE, the Hittites, led by King Sukiluiluma, would wage war against Mitanni, eventually conquering and sacking the Mitanni capital. The Hittites would also make a push into Syria, conquering much of the region, including the strategically vital city of Kadesh. This invasion could not have come at a worse time for Egypt, as the 18th dynasty was in a crisis. The contentious rule of Akhenaten, the heretic pharaoh, would be followed by the very short and weak reign of his son, Tutankhamun. This would eventually lead to the fall of the 18th dynasty. After the pharaoh I, the general Horemheb would seize power and initiate the 19th dynasty after granting power to Ramses I. These internal issues would allow the Hittites free reign in Syria, and they would flip many vassals to their side. However, this was not to last. By 1280 BCE, the pharaoh, Seti I, would lead a campaign into Syria and recapture much of the territory, including Kadesh, as well as defeating a large Hittite army in the region. However, Seti was unable to maintain complete control of the newly gained territory and would declare a ceasefire. Pharaoh would die the next year, and in 1279 BCE, the Hittites
Hittites would quickly retake Kadesh and Amru. Ramses II would succeed his father and immediately dealt with Sheridan pirates that were threatening the Egyptian coast. He would then build a new capital called Pi Ramses in the eastern Nile Delta. In 1275 BCE, Ramses would re-enter Syria with an Egyptian army and secure Amaru before returning to Pi Ramses. The Hittites, meanwhile, had been at war across multiple fronts and were unable to respond. But by the mid-1270s BCE, the wars had mostly come to a close, and the Hittite king, Muatali II, prepared for war with Egypt in the following year. In 1274 BCE, Muatali would assemble the largest Hittite army in the empire's history and marched it into Syria. Ramses II had also prepared a large force, and the two kings would meet each other near Kadesh. The Egyptians had brought 2,000 light chariots, manned by 4,000 men, as well as 16,000 infantry. The Egyptian force was then divided evenly into four smaller armies, named after the gods Amun, Ra, Ta, and Set. Ramses had done this to allow for greater military flexibility in order to pursue multiple objectives at once. The Hittite army consisted of around 3,000 heavy chariots, manned by 10,000 men, and around 15,000 infantry. The Hittite strategy was focused around a shock chariot assault to bring victory. Sometime in late May, Ramses would lead the Amun division across the Orontes River toward the city of Kadesh, which was around a day's march away. The pharaoh's forces would capture two Shezi Bedouin nomads, who told him that the Hittites were nowhere near Kadesh. However, it is likely that these men were sent by Muatali to trick the pharaoh, as the Hittite army was actually very close. Ramses would push towards Kadesh and constructed a defensive camp nearby. However, later in the day, Egyptian scouts would return with two captured Hittites. After being beaten, they would reveal to Ramses that Muatali's entire army was encamped behind a nearby hill on the other side of the river. Ramses had made a terrible mistake and set out to rectify the situation. He immediately sent messengers to hurry the other three divisions to Kadesh, and another messenger to summon a division of foreign troops from nearby lands. The raw division was about seven miles south of the pharaoh's camp, and after receiving the message, they would quickly cross the Orontes River to aid the pharaoh. Buatali knew an Egyptian army was near, but he did not know how large or exactly where it was. So he sent a 500-strong chariot force to discover its location. The chariots would come across the exposed raw division in marching column. The chariots would swiftly charge the unprepared Egyptian troops, which were shattered. What was left of Ra's chariots and experienced troops made a swift withdrawal to the camp, while many others routed in all directions. The remnants of the Ra division warned Ramses of the impending attack, and defenses were prepared. The Hittite chariots swept towards the western part of the Egyptian camp, and charged, smashing through the Egyptian lines. While much of the Egyptian line was broken, the Hittite charge was slowed and disoriented by the camp tents and well stored. Many Hittites, believing the battle had been won, began to loot the camp. The Egyptian infantry then reorganized and counterattacked. The pharaoh himself would then personally lead his own chariot forces around the Hittites and charge into their rear. Ramses would then press the counterattack, charging after the routing Hittite chariots. Muatali had witnessed these events from a nearby hill, and formed up his remaining chariots and launched an attack on the eastern side of the Egyptian camp. But before the moment of disaster, a division of foreign troops came to reinforce the pharaoh. From the north, they attacked the flank of the Hittite force. Muatali would then quickly withdraw across the river after taking heavy losses. Later in the day, the Ta division would arrive and Ramses would quickly take Kadesh as well as execute any Amun and Ra division troops who had fled the battle. Muatali, who had taken heavy casualties, would propose a truce to Ramses. The pharaoh would quickly accept, as he had also taken substantial casualties in the mostly inconclusive battle. Both sides would claim victory at Kadesh, but while tactically the Egyptians seemed to have had the upper hand, overall the campaign was a strategic disaster. Due to the great losses Ramses had taken, 
He was forced to withdraw to Egypt and later had to put down many anti-Egyptian revolts in Canaan and Syria. After the Egyptian withdrawal, Muatali would quickly reoccupy Kadesh and Amalu, and they would remain in Hittite hands permanently. Sixteen years after the battle, in 1258 BCE, Ramses II would conclude the world's first surviving peace treaty with Muatali's successor, Mursali III. The two great powers would become allies and remained at peace until the Great Bronze Age collapsed and the fall of the Hittite Empire. We're back. Hello. Got yourself back on on the mic. I am. Hello. And we're back. <laughs> First Hello. off, props to you on making documentaries, man. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. And it was a lot of fun. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess we we can talk about it now. We can talk about the Battle of Kadesh and um, I guess the surrounding era and the two um, two sides. So we can talk about you know. Egypt's new kingdom a little bit, I guess, and, and the Hittites, if we, All right. if we know anything about that. <laughs> My knowledge of this area is a bit more limited than later in antiquity and the classical era. Just about. I'm not a big Egyptology man. My brother yeah. in Akhenaten. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I know a lot of Egyptian history. I'm like a swimming Egyptian mm. in denial. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We're getting puns now. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot more about the the later Egyptian era with like, but that's like the Greek era. So yeah. Ptolemaic Egypt. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that later on, or yeah. in, but I guess we we should talk about one of the most controversial things about the Battle of Kadesh, and that's who won the Battle of Kadesh, and whether the other thing is whether Ramses the Second, Ramses the Great, made the right decision to split his army into mm -hmm. four. And what are your opinions on? Well, well let's start with Ramses II's decision. First, first, if you're going over who won the battle, it's more going for the tactical victory of taking the city state of Kadesh, mm -hmm. uh, which remained in Hittite hands, on which count I'd consider that a Hittite victory because mm -hmm. they accomplished their goal right there. You're on both sides playing victory. If you're not walking away with the prize, what's the dang point? Exactly. I do, I do agree with that. I, I would say that the, uh, the Egyptians, as was pointed out in the documentary, the Egyptians definitely tactically probably won the battle. Mm -hmm. it's at the site, um, the Hittites and Muatali II did like did retreat, and it was Muatali II himself who asked Ramses II for a ceasefire, and the Egyptian forces did in fact enter the city of Kadesh and they mm -hmm. did sack it, but um, due to the losses that Ramses II, I think he actually probably did take heavier losses than Muatali. Which is probably why he eventually pulled back and agreed to terms of treaty on account of the fact well. It's a lot harder to occupy a city than it is to fight for one. Mm. Especially if population don't like you too much. Although this is population antiquity, it's not nearly as booming as it is now. Yeah, for sure. But, yeah, and no, I do agree with that as well. But I, I believe that Ramses II probably realized that he could not, he couldn't hold the city and yeah. decided rather that it was um, to his benefit that he would pull back. And, and plus, mm -hmm. um, it seems that people in the area also believe that the Egyptians had lost the battle because there were a bunch of anti-Egyptian revolts that followed the battle almost immediately and mm -hmm. he had to take basically the remnants of his forces to, to put down those and he couldn't even you know worry about Kadesh yeah. at, after after that so so how great can this Ramses guy be yeah he's actually known to be the great because he built so many statues of himself oh, yeah. so uh, a pretty I'm a big <laughs> Abu Simbel fan <laughs> a pretty pretty common thing for for lots of um, I guess leaders of antiquity and the classical era to be a bit of uh, a bit narcissistic. Yeah. If I what's that <laughs> old uh, Percy Shelley poem? Look upon my works, ye mighty in despair. <laughs> yeah. And I look past, and all I saw was desert. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we were ready to segue into. I, I so let's let's I guess let's stick with Kadesh really right, because this is the this is the shortest one that we've got so we have yeah. I guess we have a bit of time let's let's talk about whether you, what do you what do you think do you think that Ramses II made the right decision to split his army into four groups now the reason that this has, he did decide to split his armies into four groups well uh, it's generally that he wanted to be able to take on multiple targets at once but it's also because of the way that battles happened in this era and 
it was due to the fact that most battles were were much smaller scale mm -hmm. and this is probably like the earliest like really really large scale the only probably one before this was the battle of of megiddo which yeah. was about this point probably like a hundred years before so for a century basically they've been fighting skirmishes mm -hmm. and um, I guess Ramses the second believed that it would be advantageous to split his army and you know take on multiple objectives and and probably didn't expect to meet a Hittite army of anywhere between 20 and potentially up to 30 some source the Egyptian sources I think say up to like 45 but it's, it's highly unlikely that yeah that he would that they have that, that, that many historians <laughs> they're, just, they're just like that's a lame number. Double it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, my. I had twenty thousand troops. I think I. It would be. It'd be pretty cool if the enemy had, you know, over twice that. But the Herodotus special. <laughs> it's much more likely. These three hundred Spartans. Took and they were like a million, million Persians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exa exaggerating. Um. Which. Which. Which is another. That's early propaganda. Thing. Yeah. Exactly. Which is another interesting thing that. Basically, all of our sources from this battle come almost solely from from the Egyptians. Well, yeah, because the Hittites, correct me if I'm wrong, they were wiped out by the Assyrians. Well, they were they were fighting the Assyrians, but as for how their actual collapse oh, happened, it's still, a, it's still a mystery. Ah, see, the Sea Peoples. <laughs> yeah, the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples. <laughs> the Sea Peoples, their, their return in this era is what is what the Egyptians at least claim. But most of the Hittites seem to, even like, in the writings that we do have from them, mm -hmm. barely discuss this this battle at all. I guess because I mean, you'd think that which is which is what you'd think would mean that I mean it could mean multiple things. Either it didn't really, either we just don't have the tablets that we lost. They're lost to time, which is probably the biggest possibility. But mm -hmm. another possibility is that they didn't really seem to think that it was as, as big of a deal as as the Egyptians made it out to be. Yeah. But also, in this area, a lot of pre-Arabic writings were destroyed by extremists throughout history. Yeah. Uh, so, from an archaeological standpoint, it hurts. Oh, for it sure. It hurts a lot. Uh, but, so, there is a good chance we have lost a lot of these records to time. Oh, for sure. That's what happened to a lot of, like, the uh, Assyrian, um, like, Assyrian cities and ruins and stuff like mm -hmm. that. They were destroyed through, like, I mean... Even ISIS were, was bombing some cities yeah. and back a couple of years back, I remember. I mean, a, a battle that, like, at least, like, the modern Syrian, like, uh, uh, the Syrians, actually, and I guess, like, Russians, too, they fought against, um, like, al-Nusra, like, yeah. the terrorist groups, and they fought literally at the ancient city of Palmyra mm -hmm. and the ruins. So a lot of a lot of cities had ancient, like, stuff has been destroyed. Though, actually, at the time... There was also an engagement near Palmyra uh, under Patton, I remember, in the Second World War. Yeah. Yeah. There's been there's lots of battles at like historical sites and they definitely do not go well to um, preserving the sites. No. However, in in ironically, in in terms of like ancient times, his archaeologists and historians like I guess pray that that cities get burned to the ground because that's usually what happens. The best way of preserving because it preserves the the cities and mm -hmm. under um, basically layers of ash and it also mm -hmm. um, any like clay tablets and such are get baked and they yeah. get preserved and it makes it a lot easier for them to um to find to uh, like discover them and in good condition and be able to like read them and decipher them so that's mm -hmm. i guess a bit of an irony not good for the people at the time and but good for us i guess <laughs> where's ruins is nothing new i mean if you've ever been to pisa italy uh they have the largest baptistry in the world there something called the Camposanto, which was the largest collection of uh Forgetting the word right now, frescoes, medieval mm. frescoes in the world, until, of course, the roof was hit by a shell during the Second World War, the lead roof burned down. So every little bit of these frescoes popped off the walls, these little flakes. But Dean Keller, who was on the Monuments Men, uh, first guy in there afterwards, <coughs> painstakingly made sure every one of these flakes was picked up. And so they've since been reconstructed as best they can on these panels that they can now remove. And the Campo Santo is where all the Italian archbishops are buried. Aside from one grave, one grave, Dean Keller, United States military. <laughs> this is a little neat compensation fact. But what I was saying is, uh, the Pretty cathedral at Pisa is made entirely out of recycled uh, marble mm. from Roman times. They just took it from old ruins. You can see old inscriptions on them. Oh, really? I yeah, didn't know that. It is gorgeous. If you ever have the chance to go, go. Yeah, I would definitely like to go see that myself. That's actually a, com a pretty common thing that, that I mean, especially in, in antiquity, that like, less the reason that, like the uh, the pyramids, like the Egyptian pyramids of Giza, like the way that they 
they they kind of look like steps now. Mm-hmm. Actually, they used to be at the time be pretty much like covered flat. Yeah. But other pharaohs and people after the world's they, greatest slide. Yeah, they <laughs> they take the the basically the slabs and off. They were limestone it. slabs, right? Um, I, be, I do believe so, yeah. And they took them to either build their own pyramids or their own monuments, and so lots of that stuff is. But I mean, fortunately, fortunately, the main the main structures themselves are are still there. But mm-hmm. um, for historians, we do I, I guess archaeologists do wish that most cities get burned down, which is <laughs> which sounds really sad, yeah. but it um, it does help us. Um, I've help never us. heard about the clay tablets being baked. That's yeah, like that I never is, thought of. Yeah, that is um, something that many of my history professors have, have driven home, that they're like, like, please, please find the burned down city so we can find the, the clay tablets with the writing baked. <laughs> oh, my. See, that's my big archaeological kind of man boner right now is for Herculaneum, the excavation of the Herculaneum Library, because they've developed technology to scan these scrolls, or I heard about this years ago, and I've never gotten an update on it, uh, because all preserved because the pyroclastic flow basically fl- went straight over the city, mm. uh, fused a lot of these deals, and also so damn brittle and covered in ash for all of it. Although you will never find an intact skeleton at uh, Herculaneum because the pyroclastic flow comes down at roughly 300 degrees Celsius. So by the time it got to you, your brain would boil and your head would literally explode. Yeah, that's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, superheated volcanic gas. But <laughs> all right. Well, speaking of libraries, I guess that help does help us segue. We can segue into Alexandria. Mm-hmm. So most of Alexandria's library and lots of their history was all burned down. So unfortunately, we lost a ton of that stuff. But one thing from Alexandria that a very famous person was buried there, and his mm-hmm. name is Alexander the Great. And we still don't know where his grave is, but this doesn't mean that he wasn't real. It just means that he's probably underwater because lots of modern, like, or at least ancient Alexandria is currently under the water. And they have not been able to go basically into these, like, areas to I guess it's knocked off his nose. (laughs) But (laughs) under the water makes it a bit hard to to excavate some stuff. But you want to run it? um, I guess we we can can give an initial discussion. All right. So, we're gonna as seg- you mentioned, how's the end of the great? Yeah. He died. We're going to segue into, yeah, to Alexander the Great. And so, I guess we should give an intro. So, the next thing we're going to talk about is the wars of the Diadochi, which is um, the successor wars, basically. There are, there are four main ones that happened after the death of Alexander the Great. And they were fought between, basically, all of his generals and um, one of his um, <laughs> secretaries, which is... An interesting thing that did occur. Did pretty decent for him. Yeah, he did. All things considered, Eumenes did do pretty. Don't pretty screw good. with secretaries. We've learned. <laughs> yeah, he he surprised um, many of Alexander's generals. Actually, defeated some of his most famous ones, like like Craterus, in, mm-hmm. in battle. And so, but I guess we can touch on Alexander the Great first. Alexander the Great, the son of Philip II. Yep. Um, basically, was Macedonian boy. Macedonian boy, and from Macedonia, and they were, I guess, they're technically Greeks, though the Greeks at the time would have considered them to be, um, like, lesser Greeks, and actually yeah. did consider, they considered the, the family itself, the royal family, to technically be, like, kind of Greek, but they basically considered the rest of Macedonians to be barbarians, so you can... It was considered a backwater country. Yeah, exactly, and... It's Greece, Louisiana. <laughs> exactly. Hopefully no one comes after us for that, but yeah. it's all good. I'm just imagining Cajun Alexander right now. <laughs> Cajun Alexander. Oh, conquer some demarcated person over there. <laughs> <laughs> but Alexander the Great, um, he or one of the reasons that the Greeks considered them to be um, backwaters because they still used um, they were kingdom and they had a king, and mm-hmm. most of the Greek city states, including even like Sparta at this time, had moved on to um, democracy. So, a democracy that's so undemocratic that it makes empires look more free. But, yeah. and, um, yeah, we, but we're not talking most about the Greeks but as of right now, but Alexander the Great's father decided that, you know, um, he would take advantage of Greek weakness and at the time, and especially after the Spartans had been defeated by the Thebans, mm-hmm. and would take advantage of some of the chaos and basically... Um, I'm a big sacred band of Thebes fan. Yeah. 
the, the 300, 300 brothers. <laughs> 300 fighting gay men. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is that is the story, and it's probably true, considering how the Greeks um, lived yeah. it. Yeah. All right, if you want, I can tell this one real quick. We got time. We got we like have, two uh, hours. We have, well, they... <laughs> I mean, right. you can go into okay, maybe, so you can go into more detail. Uh, Thebes was originally under an equal partnership with Sparta. Mm. Problem is, they fought the Athenians in the Peloponnesian War. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Spartans were in, on a bit of a little bully pulpit there and kept pushing it so they were more of a lesser partner. Mm. And so there were the Theban loyalist faction, and then you had kind of what was such a count to be Theban nationalists or city stationalists. Uh, but so. One night, one of them hosts a big old party for all the Spartan supporters, etc. Gets them all together, gets them all nice and drunk, and the Theban nationalists go and murder everybody. Uh, <laughs> Spartans didn't take too kindly to this. They're like, yo, what's the deal? Why would you screw with us? We literally have the one standing army, which they had because they kept a shit ton of them. Push the button. Uh, yeah, hit the button. Hit the button. We'll, we'll wait for a minute. Give but a second. Yeah, and they because they, they had the helots. Yeah, they fought at Lectura, right? That's where they. That's where the Thebans and the Spartans fought, right? They clashed twice. But uh, the, the main, the famous battle is Lectura because that's yes. where the Spartan forces were routed, right? And yeah. the, that's basically where the, the legend of the Theban sacred band was, mm -hmm. was born, right? Yeah, sacred band of Thebes. So, are we? Are we? Do uh, we know if we're back? I think we're already back. Oh, I, think, I think we, I don't no, know if he hit the, I don't I'm know. Sure. Who knows? It's all right. Well, <laughs> well, I, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll just repeat that quickly. But basically, um, the, <coughs> you can keep, just keep going. Continue. All right. So we'll, we'll get to lecture in a bit. <laughs> our good, good Stephen boys. Well, Spartans don't take too kindly to them murdering all their friends. Understandably, So they guess. come on in. They're <laughs> like, hey. It's about time y'all pay up. The Stephen's are like, we're going to pay up. With murder. And so, <laughs> the humans were out of this early Spartan force just through sheer, I don't know, gusto? Who knows? Yeah. Uh, because Spartans themselves hadn't been militarily challenged in a good long while. And even just to go into that a bit while we're, while we're on this subject of Sparta, so Sparta itself is, is known as, you know, the most famous land power in, in ancient Greece and like it's, it's well, because, I mean, they're famous, but yeah, because a lot of people in the West had giant hard ons for their eugenic system. Yeah, but the Spartans actually, Look at you Jefferson, <laughs> the Spartans themselves actually, or like at the time, most Greeks actually, amazing. This most of the Spartan, like the like the whole like Spartan thing is actually a myth that they weren't. I, many of them actually thought of them more as like they were they were athletes and they they thought of them as, but they actually thought of them more as like often as poets and such, not as as being like. Um, these hardcore warriors that most people actually think of. Not the as. Gerard Butler 300. Yeah, definitely Everybody not. Everybody ripped. Yeah, definitely you know? not that. So, but they they did um they did focus a lot on athletics and they were very good at like the Olympics and stuff. And they did have a standing army because all their work was done by slaves. Yeah. As helots. Yeah. So. And they were also the one of the only Greek powers to enslave other Greeks, which is why they were actively despised by most other Greeks. They weren't big fans. They also, during the Peloponnesian Wars, took m lots of Persian money to fight against the Athenians because, the, uh, I mean, the Greeks will never tell you this, but let's just say that the Greeks definitely took whatever the Persians gave them to fight each other. So, <laughs> they hey, you're not going to be one to say no to help. Yeah. Even when that help did burn your whole country. Not 150 years before. Well. But, but so back, sacred back, to the, back to the sacred so, band of Thebes. <laughs> the Thebes, they're like, all right, you're going to be fighting in pairs of twos. And the pairs of twos, guess what they are? Gay Ooh. lovers. The whole idea, if you're fighting with your lover, yeah, your butt bumping buddy, uh, you're going to fight harder. It's like, hey, babe, let me ch watch me chuck this spear into the Spartan man. Yeah. Uh, and miraculously, this band of 300, along with, you know, the rest of the Theban army, <laughs> the Theban army uh, routed the Spartans. At Lectura, yeah. Pushed they, their butts all the way back and secured Theban independence. Which is, which is an interesting thing, which, because this was, at the time, since Sparta was the dominant power, but though they had not been, you know, as you said, not military challenged in quite a while, they, this was a shocking thing to the, the rest of the Greek world, as basically the, 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 the fledgling power of Sparta at this time had been 
officially crushed. And the Sparta would basically, this was the last time that Sparta was, was actually relevant for, for the rest of history. And so they were defeated by the Thebans, and the Thebans would actually basically turn to their former enemy and make an alliance with, with Athens. <laughs> and so when, and they would actually be the ones to fight the main two forces of the, Athe the Athenians and the main, the, the famous 300 Theban sacred band. They would fight against mm -hmm. Philip II and Alexander the Great. And lose. And so lose there goes at, the Theban sacred yeah, band. Yeah, at Chironeer. And they were, uh, officially, they were had to be killed by the last, to the last man because they, they put fear into the Macedonian ranks, which were made, the Macedonians actually fought in a, a different type of phalanx. They fought with long Sarissa spears, which were about um, 17 to 20 feet long, and which, as opposed to the three meter long spears of the Greeks. And they often wore like lighter armor. They used smaller shields, but they made up with it with just like sheer mass. But big old spears. And big old spears. And so they were not as good in hand to hand combat, but the goal was to never get to that point and to keep the enemies at bay while the cavalry would ham basically hammer and handle them from behind. And that was the main Macedonian strategy. But by doing this, it also meant that the Macedonians were able to basically amass a much larger army because they could basically give a pike and a shield and a helmet to anybody. And, and they just basically took a bunch of farmers, and that was that. that literally, so that was the Macedonian army. In the first place. Yeah. It's kind of upheaval you wouldn't have if the middle class soldiers were told that they could the army. Yeah. And... So they completely overpowered the, the Greeks at Chironeer, and then they took all the way down to, to Greece. And um, basically, so they once they conquered Greece, they actually never conquered Sparta. They actually left Sparta alone. But I, but <laughs> if Macedon's to Louisiana, Sparta's kind of like Portland. Yeah. That it kind of goes off. And, um, <laughs> yeah, Sparta, they just decided that they weren't going to touch Sparta. I, I, I don't specifically know why Philip II decided this, but I do know that, um, well, Philip was on his worst yeah, yeah, I do know that they took, I'm on mute. How long has he been on mute? I'm not on mute. All right, I guess, um, well, Cameron's going to go. Give me a moment. Okay. All right. Cameron's going to go give, um, go grab some batteries. So I'll quickly segue into our next documentary. So Alexander the Great, um, Philip II, yeah, Philip II suddenly would die, right? He was assassinated uh, most likely by, Ale yeah, by, by most likely by Alexander the Great's mother and his at this point, basically ex-wife, or, or because he wanted to remarry into a different family, into a Greek family. And um, Alexander the Great's mother was um, a Molossian, or from Epirus. She was an Illyrian. I'm throwing a bunch of these ancient terms at you, but she was a, a foreigner, is what they considered her. And, <laughs> and so he wanted a Greek wife and a Greek heir. And Alexander the Great's mother basically worried that he, her, her child, who of the gods of Zeus would not become the king. So she probably had him assassinated. Alexander the Great was probably part of this, if we're being completely honest. And he took control. The Thebans thought this was a good time to rebel. And so he burned the city to the ground, which was a very common thing for Alexander the Great that he did a lot. But, and then- Hey, we already went over. Burning a city is a good thing. Burning the city is, for, is a good thing for history, <laughs> but not for the, not people, for the, the people living there. <laughs> so Alexander would take his army and decided to, you know, invade the Persian Empire, which was the Greeks' rival at the time. And after a great many battles, uh, victories against, um, um, against um, Memnon, Memnon of Rhodes, and he would defeat um, Dar Darius III at Issus, mm -hmm. and then later on at the famous Battle of Galgamela, which is the Supposedly, according to Macedon, forty to seventy thousand um, Macedonians would battle against. Um, a co probably, according to Macedonians, it was like a million, but in reality, it was probably closer to a hundred, a hundred fifty thousand at yeah. mo at most, maybe two hundred thousand. But it was probably around a hundred. Um, you can ask Greeks 000. now; they still do like inflation. <laughs> the numbers keep going up, unfortunately for them, <laughs> as their currency gets worse. <laughs> 
big deck guys. But uh, but yeah. So yeah, so Alexander Conquers most known world. He would, yep. Problem is he's got a little kid as an heir. He gets sick. Bang boom bop. Yeah. He did. The insane man of Alexander the Great. Um, the famous narcissist, the most famous narcissist of history, probably one of at least. I'm Name. going for the title. <laughs> Didn't he name? I know he named at least 20 cities after himself. Oh some, yeah. Some sort of they have to 70. He named one after his horse too. So you can. Thing is, you name 70 after yourself. There's a good chance at least one or two will make it to the modern world. Yeah, and that's where Alexandria and Egypt comes in, right? The most famous Alexandria in the world. But yeah, so Alexander the Great would, um, you know, die at the bright old age of 32 or 33. Um, yeah. And his um, successors, or his generals at the time, were like, Alexander, your heir is a child. Who should succeed you? Like, we need to know this, or there's going to be chaos. Who's going to manage this? And Alexander's. Supposed last words were the strongest. Because and he was a dramatic little bitch. Our, oh, yeah, we can't say we, that. We can say that. <laughs> we can say that. <laughs> so Alexander the Great, famous last words. Um, to the know, strongest. To the strongest. Which and leads us. To our next documentary, The Wars of Dyadache. So you can see how well that probably went over with his, his generals um, as to, you know, who would succeed Alexander the Great? So we're going to segue into the Wars of the Dyadache, which is our next documentary. It's longer than the last one, and it's more in-depth. But, yeah, um, whenever you're ready, um, Hit her. send us to the next doc. Boo. There we go. Yeah, buddy. This is the wrong documentary. Calvacone, <laughs> Northern Italy. Yeah, this is the wrong one. Adam, um, other one. The other one. <laughs> That's the Republic one. We'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> there we go. Beautiful. All right, I'm going to meet myself now. Looks like the same park, though. Karabag, it Central is Turkey. It's the same park. <laughs> this is the site of the ancient village of Ipsus. Hi, I'm Adam Array. In 301 BC, a great battle would take place here at Ipsus between four men claiming succession over Alexander's Macedonian Empire. The empire has been split between Alexander's many generals, and the fourth and final war of the Diadochi has reached its climax. For roughly the last 20 years or so, Alexander's former empire has been stricken with constant infighting and struggle that would end Alexander's dynasty and permanently divide his once great empire. Now, prepare to witness the various battles and conflicts that took place during the four wars of the Diadochi as Alexander's generals battled to claim succession over his empire. To the vast numbers of soldiers, their formations, and the context and history of the engagements, now on Decisive Eras. To fully see how Alexander's great empire was plunged into chaos, we must go back to around 30 years before Ipsus. On October 1st, 331 BCE, Alexander the Great led his army of 50,000 men against the King of Persia, Darius III's 150,000 men, chariots, and elephants on the dusty plain of Gaugamela. Despite the numerical disadvantage, Alexander would win a stunning victory smashing the Persian forces and causing Darius to flee. Alexander would pursue Darius to Bactria, where he'd find the King of Kings dead, killed by his own general. The Achaemenid Persian Empire was no more, and Alexander would conquer the remaining satraps before going south to India, where he won his last great victory at Hadassus in 326 BCE. However, his soldiers would go no further, forcing Alexander to return to Babylon, where he would never leave. In 323 BCE, Alexander the Great, who had conquered the Great Persian Empire, died at age 32, only 12 years after becoming the King of Macedonia. In June 323 BC, Alexander the Great became extremely ill, and less than two weeks later, he would die at age 32 in Babylon. When his generals had asked him who should succeed him, Alexander had replied, 
the strongest. Alexander had formed the greatest empire in the world at the time. However, he had no official heir, and so it didn't take long for conflict to begin. While Alexander's wife, Roxana, was pregnant, there was no guarantee it would be a son. A conflict between whether Alexander's brothers, Aridaeus, should become king or not emerged, and the great general Perdiccas would come out on top after having General Meleager killed. Perdiccas would become regent of the Macedonian Empire, and would divide the empire between the various generals who had supported him. Roxana would later give birth to a son, Alexander IV, who technically became the official king of the empire. Meanwhile, revolts in Greece and Bactria were quickly put down, and Perdiccas went to Cappadocia to aid the governor, Eumenes, against the remaining Persian resistance there. Perdiccas now found an opportunity to gain a place in the royal line of succession after discovering Alexander's sister Cleopatra desired to marry him. While he was already married to the daughter of another governor, Antipater, Perdiccas wrote letters to Cleopatra promising to marry her. These letters were intercepted, however, by the general Antigonus. Antigonus would inform Antipater, and the two men, along with the renowned general Craterus, would prepare their armies to cross over to Asia Minor and attack Perdiccas. The growing coalition would also gain the support of another general, Ptolemy, who controlled Egypt. Perdiccas was still completely unaware of the impending war on him, and was focused on sending Alexander's body back to Macedonia. Ptolemy, however, would seize this opportunity to strike and stole Alexander's body, taking it to Egypt. Only a year after Alexander's death, the first war of the Diadochi would begin after Ptolemy stole Alexander's body and took it to Egypt. Perdiccas would lead an army south to invade Egypt and sent Eumenes to Anatolia to deal with Antigonus and Antipater. In 321 BCE, Perdiccas reached the Nile Delta, but was prevented from crossing by Ptolemy's army. Perdiccas would attempt to quickly cross and assaulted an ill-defended force. However, Ptolemy's army arrived to support them and pushed Perdiccas back. He now marched further south and attempted to cross at another point. The river crossing was deeper, however, and many men drowned as they tried to retreat back to the shore. Perdiccas' army now demanded blood, and so the generals would kill Perdiccas. One of these generals was a man named Seleucus. In Asia Minor, Antipater's forces had crossed into Phrygia. Many local governors and generals refused to serve under Eumenes, and another general, Neoptolemus, betrayed Eumenes, and after a small clash, retreated to join Antipater. Believing Eumenes was doomed, Antipater sent half his army under the revered general Craterus and Neoptolemus to finish him off. The two armies would meet in battle near the Hellespont, and Craterus believed the Macedonian soldiers under Eumenes would defect to him once they saw him. Eumenes was aware of the renown of Craterus, and had only foreign troops line up against him. No Macedonians were included on the left wing, and the army was told that they were fighting the traitor Neoptolemus. The infantry would never see battle, as Craterus would die fighting the foreign troops, and the rest of his army completely routed after his death. Despite this stunning victory, the forces of Antipater had already won the war with the death of Perdiccas and quickly seized Susa and Babylon, repartitioning the empire. Antipater would become the new regent, and the royal family was sent back to Macedonia. Lastly, Antigonus would be given a large army and sent back to Asia Minor to finish off the remaining pro perdiccas forces, and Antigonus would meet Eumenes in battle at Orkinia in 319 BCE. Antigonus would deceive his enemy by extending his line to double what it would normally be, and making his army look massive. Eumenes' disheartened troops were quickly overrun and crushed. What loyalists remained under Eumenes retreated to the city of Mora, where Antigonus would follow him. Antigonus would offer him peace, but awaited orders from Antipater for his approval. Antipater, however, would pass away at age 80 while Antigonus was finishing off the remaining resistance in Phrygia. After being informed of Antipater's death, Antigonus generously offered Eumenes peace, as well as his former governorship of Cappadocia and a position as Antigonus' second in command. Eumenes would quickly accept. Back in Macedonia, Polyperchon had succeeded Antipater in 318 BCE, but Antipater's son, Cassander, was gathering an army to confront him. Cassander would form an alliance with Antigonus. Looking for allies, 
Polly Perchin sent a messenger to Eumenes with an enticing offer. Although Eumenes had agreed to join Antigonus, Polly Perchin made him an offer he couldn't refuse. He granted him title of King's General in Asia, as well as large sums of money and command of the elite Silver Shields. Antigonus was outraged and abruptly halted his plans to invade Macedonia in order to deal with Eumenes, who was quickly heading east in order to enlist the aid of the eastern governor. By the time Antigonus had reached Mesopotamia, Eumenes had gathered a large army. Eumenes' forces would blunt Antigonus's crossing of the Cephrates River, capturing 4,000 men and forcing Antigonus to travel around the Zagros Mountain. However, while Eumenes wanted to head back to Asia Minor, his allies forced him to head back to Persepolis before heading north to confront Antigonus again at Peraticana. In 317 BC, Eumenes and Antigonus would meet in battle at Peraitikene. Each general would lead around 40,000 men. Both Antigonus and Eumenes would put their most elite troops on their right wing, a position of honor in the Macedonian line. Antigonus's light cavalry on the left wing would drive back Eumenes' elite cavalry before being chased away. The two main phalanx lines would collide, and Eumenes' elite silver shields crushed Antigonus' infantry who began to retreat. Antigonus himself, on his right wing, found an opening in Eumenes' left and routed the left wing of Eumenes' army before falling back. While the battle ended in a stalemate, Eumenes had come off better, losing far less men. Antigonus' army, now weakened, would attempt to catch Eumenes off guard by attacking in the winter of 316 BCE instead of waiting for the summer. His plan was foiled, however, and Eumenes prepared to meet Antigonus at a plain near Gabriena. Antigonus would use the same formation he had previously, but Eumenes would place his elite troops on his left in order to face Antigonus's right. Eager for a swift victory, Eumenes charged his cavalry and elephants, which took the large dust cloud, allowing Antigonus's light cavalry to sneak off and assault Eumenes's baggage troop. While Eumenes's cavalry assault was unsuccessful, his phalanx, led by the silver shield, shattered Antigonus's army, which routed. After the battle, Eumenes was informed that their baggage train had been taken. For the silver shields, this was disastrous as their entire families and possessions were now withheld by Antigonus. Thinking only for themselves, the Silver Shields seized Eumenes and brought him before Antigonus. Antigonus pondered what to do with him, and after much consideration, reluctantly had Eumenes executed. The impressive career of Alexander's former secretary turned general came to an end. After the Battle of Gavianae, the Second War of the Diadochi came to a close. Antigonus had won, and now became the most powerful of the successors, gaining control of all the Asian provinces. Antigonus quickly set about consolidating his power. He had many of the traitorous leaders and governors executed and imprisoned. Antigonus also did not trust the Silver Shields after their betrayal of Eumenes, and had them subtly disposed of by sending them to fight hostile mountain tribes in the harsh regions of the empire. Seleucus, who now controlled Babylon, had a dispute with his former ally Antigonus, and fearing for his life, fled to Egypt to inform Ptolemy of Antigonus's actions. Ptolemy would then form a coalition with his fellow governors, Asander, Lysimachus, and Cassander, who had recently taken control of Macedonia after defeating Polyperchon and executing Alexander the Great's mother, Olympias. In 314 BCE, Antigonus decided to strike first, taking over Phoenicia and much of Cyprus, and ordered the construction of a large fleet in order to challenge Ptolemy's naval control of the eastern Mediterranean. In 313 BCE, Ptolemy made a surprise attack, retaking Cyprus and raiding the Anatolian coast before heading back to Egypt. Seleucus would convince Ptolemy to retake Syria and the Levant, and they would meet Demetrius in battle at Gaza in 312 BCE. Despite being outnumbered, Demetrius' forces seemed to initially gain the upper hand, but after his elephants were killed, his army panicked and was completely destroyed. 9,000 of Demetrius' men, nearly half of his army, were killed or captured. Ptolemy would retake his lost territory and sent a smaller army to finish off the remnants of Demetrius' forces. However, Demetrius would successfully ambush the Ptolemaic army at Myers and sent a messenger to his father asking for reinforcements. Antigonus, who had just defeated Asander, rejoined his son 
and retook all the lost territory before preparing to assault Egypt with his 80,000 men in 311 BCE. But Seleucus had taken control of Babylon and Susa, and Antigonus decided to postpone his invasion of Egypt. He quickly made peace with Cassander, Lysimachus, and Ptolemy, and sent his son Demetrius with 20,000 men to retake Babylon. In Greece, Cassander used this opportunity to end any threat to his control of Macedonia, and had Alexander IV and his mother Roxana killed, officially wiping out Alexander the Great's dynasty and making the Macedonian Empire officially defunct. In 310 BCE, Demetrius would retake Babylon, which had been mostly abandoned by Seleucus, before heading back to his father in the west. However, Seleucus would strike back, and Antigonus would lead his army east, sacking Babylon and meeting Seleucus in battle before being defeated by him. From 311 to 309 BC, the Babylonian War would be fought between Antigonus and Seleucus. While little is known about the war, it is clear that Seleucus came out on top as he gained control of all territory east of Babylon. Antigonus had lost control over the east, but quickly turned west as Ptolemy had taken control of the Peloponnese in Greece and coastal Anatolia. He sent his son Demetrius to retake Greece from Ptolemy and Cassander, and would land in Athens in 307 BCE, gaining territory before being ordered by his father to invade the island of Cyprus. In 306 BCE, Demetrius led his 16,000 men and hundreds of ships to assault the city of Salamis. Attempting to gain control of the eastern Mediterranean, Antigonus would send his son Demetrius to Cyprus, where he would lay siege to Salamis in 306 BC. Ptolemy had received word of the attack and brought a large army and fleet to relieve the siege. Ptolemy hoped to combine his armada with the ships trapped in the harbor of Salamis, but his plan was disrupted and a large naval battle would ensue at Salamis. Demetrius' fleet would completely overrun Ptolemy's armada, and despite his success on the left flank, Ptolemy would retreat, abandoning the city of Salamis, which would surrender soon after, along with the rest of the island of Cyprus. Ptolemy's power was significantly weakened, and Antigonus now controlled the Mediterranean. With this victory, Antigonus would proclaim himself king, and name his son Demetrius his joint king and successor. The rest of his rivals would make similar proclamations soon after. Seeing this as an opportunity to finish off Ptolemy, Antigonus would lead 90,000 men down the coast to the Nile Delta, with Demetrius shadowing with the fleet. Ptolemy's forces, however, somehow managed to hold out against both land and naval assault, and not wanting to risk a major assault across the river, Antigonus returned to Asia Minor. Antigonus would now send Demetrius to attack the island of Rhodes, which is an ally of Ptolemy. 400 ships and 40,000 men were gathered for the assault, and the huge army would land in 305 BCE. After raiding the coast of Rhodes, Demetrius would prepare to assault the city and its 7,000 defenders. The Rhodians would hold out, however, against repeated naval and land assaults, and despite coming close to taking the city, Demetrius was ultimately unsuccessful. By Antigonus's orders, the year-long siege came to an end, and a peace agreement was made. The Rhodians would construct the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, in celebration of this victory, and Demetrius would be sent back to Greece to deal with Cassander. Cassander had been laying siege to Athens, but Demetrius' arrival would change things. Cassander attempted to retreat north, but was intercepted by Demetrius' forces, resulting in the desertion of 6,000 of Cassander's troops and a humiliating defeat. Demetrius would quickly defeat Cassander and Ptolemy's forces in the Peloponnese, liberating the city-states and gaining their support, as well as marrying a Molossian princess, thus gaining an alliance with the Ephraim League in 303 BCE. Cassander would attempt to make peace with Antigonus, who promptly refused, and so Cassander called for aid from his fellow successors and formed a coalition with Lysimachus and Ptolemy against Antigonus. Seleucus's reply would take far longer, however, as he was campaigning in India against the Mauryan Empire, but the campaign ended in failure as part of the peace terms, Seleucus would receive 500 Indian war elephants. It was then, in 302 BCE, that Seleucus would receive Cassander's envoy. Accepting the alliance, he began the long march back to Asia Minor. Lysimachus would lead a surprise attack and invade Asia Minor. 
Antigonus, who was now 80 years old, retook much of his lost territory quickly and cornered Lysimachus. However, it was here that time had ran out for Antigonus. In the winter of 302 BCE, Seleucus would reach Asia Minor in record time, achieving one of the most impressive military marches in history. Seleucus and Lysimachus would unite their army as Ptolemy began assaulting the Levant. However, he would return to Egypt after hearing a false rumor that Seleucus had been defeated. Antigonus would recall Demetrius from Greece, and they would meet Seleucus and Lysimachus at Ipsus. In 301 BC, Antigonus and Seleucus would meet in battle at Ipsus. This battle would be greater than any other in the wars of the Diadochi. Over 160,000 men would fight to decide who would gain control of the crumbling Macedonian Empire. Antigonus placed Demetrius along with Pyrrhus of Epirus and 5,000 elite cavalry on the right wing, the 70,000 infantry in the center, and himself on the left wing with his remaining 5,000 cavalry. Ahead of his line, he placed his elephants and skirmishers. Standing against him were 64,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry along with hundreds of elephants mirroring his deployment. Both sides advanced their elephants and infantry them, and Demetrius would charge his elite cavalry, overwhelming Seleucus' left wing cavalry, led by his son, Antiochus. In the center, the phalanxes met, and Antigonus' experienced men began to push back the enemy line. Antigonus had engaged Lysimachus on the left wing, and on the right wing, Demetrius had turned back, looking to hit Seleucus' army from behind. However, Seleucus now sprung his trap and used his remaining elephants to prevent Demetrius from charging. He then ordered his light cavalry to flank around through a gap on the right and shatter the Antigonus infantry. Hoping Demetrius would come and turn the tide of battle, Antigonus would fight to the very end, dying in a shower of enemy javelins. <laughs> The man who had come closest to reuniting Alexander's empire would die in battle at age 81, 301 BCE, while his son Demetrius would escape to Greece. Thus ended the fourth and final war of the Diadic, and the victors would divide up Antigonus' territory. Following the death of Antigonus at Ipsus and the collapse of his forces, the coalition led by Seleucus would be victorious. However, the peace would be brief, as the former allies would turn on each other, and following the death of Cassander in 298 BC, a civil war over control of Macedonia would erupt. While the wars of the Diadochi had come to a close, the remaining successors and their descendants would continue to fight each other over Greece and the Near East for hundreds of years. It would be over 250 years until the last successor kingdom, Ptolemaic Egypt, would finally fall. It and all the others defeated by the growing power of Rome. Beautiful. All righty. Uh, Welcome back to our hexagonal table talk. Welcome back. Hope that was the, the Wars of the Diadochi. Um, our resident historian here was playing as Antigonus in it. <laughs> Single greatest acting you've ever seen from a man in loafers. Yep. That is definitely 100% true. So, all righty. I guess what we can discuss about... The Wars of the Diadochi. Now, this was obviously a, a longer documentary, but there's a lot to cover, and we didn't even cover everything in it because it was way too much. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. And there are four wars. 
bunch of battles each. These are men who define their whole lives based on war and battle. Mm -hmm. Antigonus himself, who did actually die in battle at age, at age 80, had basically fought. 81. For, yeah. Well, he, he almost won, unfortunately. I said 81. Oh, 81. Not so, and he won. Yeah, not and he won. For, he almost won. He waited won. for his son's cavalry reinforcements and never came. Because they were held up by, um, by the elephants of Seleucus, who had gained from India after he lost a uh, war to them. But Antigonus had basically fought for 50 years of his life straight. He, he served Philip II of Macedon, um, and he, in his, he fought in wars against Thracian tribes and other various barbarians, and he also fought against, you know, um, the Greeks. And then when he served, after Philip died, he served under Alexander, fought yeah. the Persians, and then, you know, for like 20 years after that, he killed all of his... Many all of his, his friends. former friends, yeah. So I mean, he was a one-eyed man, and he didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. um, and if if you ever feel like you can't do something, just remember, Antigonus died in battle at age 80, so you can do anything. Yeah. If that's not inspirational, I don't know what is. I mean, I want to go down hit by a javelin. I think I, that's. I don't. Know. I wouldn't uh, want to go down. That's what the Oracle's prophet says. Why I stay away from the Olympics? Yeah. Or, tra or track and field meets. I can't. I'm not gonna go anywhere near a track and field meet, <laughs> especially especially after what happened to you in the documentary. Like now, it's it's, it's foretold that it's it's haunting. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, you still have memories from from, <laughs> from his past life as Antigonus, oh. but alrighty. I guess we can go go into it. But yeah. So I guess we can we can also we can continue the story. So, um. After Antigonus's death, eventually, the, the this, this is in the end of the successor war. Seleucus would fight against. Um, he would actually fight against. Um, geez Louise, against Ptolemy, and they would actually turn on each other, former allies, and then um, everybody killing everybody. Eventually, Cassander would die, and Demetrius would end up taking Greece, and um, he would actually he would become allies with well, with his the person he mentored, the famous Pyrrhus of Epirus, mm -hmm. and they would they would work together, and then they'd become enemies, and they'd fight each other, and then Demetrius would lose, and he would, didn't he die in captivity but Seleucus? I and believe so, but that's what makes it a Pyrrhic victory. Yep. I'm going to let that, let that sit. That. And that's <laughs> what he's named for. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. But Pyrrhus, uh, is, Pyrrhus is named for his Pyrrhic victories against the Romans, in which he fought multiple times and won. He never lost a major battle against the Romans, but he lost a lot of his troops. <laughs> yeah. The Wars of the Diadochi were the last things that broke Greek power from, well, it's hide there. Mm. I, there are a lot better ways to measure an empire than to the strongest. And, yeah. well, it led all of the Eastern Balkans essentially fall quickly under Roman rule. Yeah. The Al Alexander... Um, Alexander probably, I mean, say, considering who he was, like his personality, I mean, this is the man who basically raged at the fact that his troops wanted to stop fighting after like, after like fighting for over a decade straight. Dad, and can I go home? I want to see my family. Yeah, and they, they, were, they were like, and he, they're like, please Alexander, can we go home? This is the man who led them through the harshest desert in the region and ha lost half his army doing so just so he could, you know, I own you and sort of thing. And mm. then he would die. After and uh, even way after the Opus Mutiny, yeah, he would he would die, and I mean he was probably considering like that he believed himself to be a literal god, and that he thought that he he was he was an intense narcissist. Oh yeah, he went to his wedding essentially dressed up as Ares. Mm -hmm. He considered himself the literal incarnation of the god of war. He thought that I, I believe his mother actually told him that he was this he was like the son of Zeus, so he. <laughs> he, Wait, he so he's <laughs> able to kill his other dad. <laughs> But, I mean, he, it, it makes sense that he basically was like, you know, I'm the king. I, I make a chess analogy. He's the king. It doesn't matter. Like, he doesn't care about the other pieces. When the king falls, everyone else falls. And so he didn't really care what happened after him. He just, he did what he, he set out to do, and he didn't care about. He also, you know, he burned the Persian city of the capital, Persepolis, to the ground. And um, so it, it had it, been the Persian capital for too long. Yeah, it had not. It, it was, it was the, recently made the capital. That it was point. the it, the Persians actually had like multiple capitals, but yeah. this was For Persepolis was the Persepolis was the like the diplomatic. The, it was like the cultural capital, and Babylon was like, and they used Babylon and Susa for like like regional capitals and military capitals. So they had 
they had basically capitals for different things, but like Persepolis was like there was like no military there, basically. When he, especially when he got there, like he there was there was no military left. He he burned the city in <coughs> according to the Greeks in a drunken state after um what uh, like uh, basically a, a mistress or like a concubine. Basically, they told him like like jokingly told him that you should burn down the city, and he was like, all right. And then they burned and. I can't say some of the words, but they um, assaulted the population and murdered a bunch of people and burned the city. And yeah. that was I mean, that was a pretty common thing for Alexander. He killed a lot of people, but he did his his last words definitely did not help his um, successors, who killed each other immediately. And as, as you heard, Ptolemy took his body to Egypt, and we don't know where his body is till today, but it's probably somewhere in Egypt. <laughs> probably been lost the same time. Yeah, probably under the water. Or being completely honest, but yeah, why don't we? The two of Alexander itself caught fire at one point. <laughs> it did. Ca Alexander did catch fire. Burned down the library. I think that happened under under Roman control, though. It did. But I guess this allegedly also knocked off his his nose. Oh yeah, one of Alexander's statues. <laughs> no, not the statue. When he went to visit the body in Alexandria, allegedly Augustus knocked the nose off the corpse of Alexander. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. That is um. A little <laughs> historical fun fact. That is kind of depressing, not going to lie, <laughs> especially considering who Augustus is. But we'll get to actually, well, we actually will get to Augustus um, not too long from now. But I guess let's go through um, some dyadic. What do you think of Alexander's decision um, to um, pit his generals against each other? Do you, how much do you think he actually cared about them? I, I feel like he didn't care that much about them. I think he probably didn't even say to the strongest. I think that's probably a myth. Some legend made up. He was in a feverish state and died. And then greedy men do as they always do, go for more. Mm -hmm. And I, it's actually pretty interesting because, like, Antigonus throughout the war, the Dyadache Wars um, basically was always on his own fighting against, after the first one at least, he basically fought by himself with his son against the other united, like, the other Dyadache. They would, they would pair with Multiple they would, times on two fronts. Yeah, and they would usually be all ally with each other against him. And it's be actually because, basically, um, Antigonus was, was looking to essentially preserve Alexander's empire. He wanted yeah. to, to keep the whole thing as one big group. But the other successors were, they honestly, they cared more about, you know, maintaining what they had gained. And, and personal wealth. Yeah, their personal wealth and ca maintaining the territory that they had gained. And so they were basically, they were allying with each other because they, they didn't really care about, like, like, Cassander didn't really care about holding Egypt. He just he cared more about keeping his territory, keeping his power, keeping his wealth, and and Antigonus threatened that because he wanted to take. Wanted to say, so would they fight together? And despite the fact that they were all rivals, and they would and they, later on they would fight each other. Not that they gained anything from it. They knew they had to get Antigonus out of there first. Yeah, they had Antigonus to. Antigonus is uh, what we like to call in here on the show a historical mega chad. 100% true. <laughs> that is, there's no better way to, to state who, um, who, what words to define Antigonus other than a mega chat. Yeah. I hope we want to so, start. So I mean, we, look, I, I guess we can. Is that, is we, we, have, we have time, but we can. Decline of Greek power? But yeah, since, I mean, since we're already here, the documentary goes pretty, pretty in depth. I mean, what do you, what do you, do you think that, what do you think would have happened? I mean, we can, we can go into some brief alternate history world before we segue, but we can, um, do you think that, what do you think if, if Antigonus had won at Ipsus, do you think that he would have been able to actually unite the empire? No. Do you think that it, you don't think I don't think so, because at this point, Macedon, surrounding territories, everything that was incorporated into Alexander's empire had been under years and years and years of war. At that point, it's a manpower issue. You're not going to have so many folks around anymore to, you'll have more uniforms than you ought to fill. Yeah. Because they're not home, they're not having kids. They're not repopulating the area, getting new soldiers for the next battle, the next battle, the next battle. And there's only so much drain you can do on a population like that. 100%. At some point, you got to realize, as a general there, it's unsustainable. you got to cut your losses, take what you got. Mm -hmm. So while I think he would have done a better job... I think he probably... Well, yeah. I mean, and... Um, but Antigonus, also... 
It wouldn't matter anyway, but you got Romans right around the corner. Yeah, they definitely, I think that Antigonus, or at least, he, because he definitely probably would not have lived that long, <coughs> even if he had successfully reunited. And the man it was, was in antiquity, and he made it to 81. Yeah. And he... Um, Whole life on battlefields, getting wounded, whatnot. None of them got yeah. infected. He, the he lived a long life for how much he fought, and he... Dude, he just lived a long life in general. If I lived to 81, I'm a happy man. Yeah. I, <laughs> he lived, he had lived in a pretty, pretty insane life, but I mean, considering, I think that had he managed to unite the empire, had Demetrius, like, basically succeeded him, though, they probably would have been able to actually put up a better defense mm -hmm. against the Romans, because one of the biggest things was the fact that the Romans took advantage of Greek, um, infighting. like, the, yeah, Greek infighting, and had there been one united front, um, he probably, they probably would have fared better, they might have even held the Romans back. I, 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 I don't know. But the, the Greeks at this point, they, had, they could not keep getting men from Greece and Macedonia. It was, it was way too fast. They were already um, using basically foreign troops from the, the regions that they controlled. And they were, they were training them in the Macedonian style. Right. But they would, it was, um, they already running into a, a manpower issue. I do think at had he defeat, defeated um, Seleucus at Ipsus, it <coughs> would have basically had been a major turning point because Cassander was already on the down. Demetrius' forces were, had basically already pushed Cassander all the way back. So had they pushed, I think that they could have secured um, Macedon, Macedon proper and, and um, Thrace. Sorry, I, I'm pulling up Demetrius' death so we can check ourselves on that. Yeah. But however, I don't know. I, I, he tried and failed so many times to take to take Egypt, I don't think that he would have ever been able to take Egypt. I don't think he would have ever been able to take back um, the rest of Macedonia. Especially going against other Macedonians who know Macedonian tactics. Yeah. That was the thing. The Macedonian phalanx was a shakeup. Mm. No one knew how to deal with it, especially not Persians who had n more or less not changed the way they'd fought. In especially because like the Persians relied heavily on like cavalry and light infantry, which is which I mean, literally, the phalanx is <laughs> a direct counter to cavalry. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I do. I I think that Antigonus would have been able to excuse me. Would have been able to. He would have been able to secure Greece and Thrace, um, because I mean, his son managed to do it with literally nothing after Antigonus died. But so I do think that he would have been able to take back because Cassander and Lysimachus were already weak. I do think that he would have been able to secure Anatolia, maybe um, Syria, Palestine. Um, basically retake the, those areas. I don't think he would have ever been able to push past Babylon and take retake Salu the Seleucid Empire. And I don't up, think that he would have been able to teach. I'd like to do a quick shout out to Babylon. Top top five city name ever. Babylon. Oh, it was like one of the first like ten major cities. You had cities like like Ur, and oh, then yeah. they're like, Ur, you know what? Ur, you know you know what? Ur slap three. A, Ur three. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Would slap as a city name. Babylon. Babylon. And they were right. It goes so hard. Babylon. Babylon. Thebes. Egypt. Which there's also a Thebes in Greece, which yeah. is, I don't know what, technically Thebes is in Egypt first. I, I don't know if that was actually called Thebes, or if that's like the Greek name for it. But I, 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 that's something I don't know. But yeah. The yeah, <laughs> but. But going into. Thebes cities, you always go by the most well known one. You're not going Memphis as the capital of Egypt. You're going Tennessee. Yeah. But Memphis. Mem Memphis at the time definitely, you know, probably would have been a little better. Pretty well known. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now and now there's nothing left of it. Now it's like half under Cairo. But <laughs> <coughs> I guess um all right. So but so you, right. you don't think that um you don't think that um Antigonus would have been able to fully reunite the empire. But I no, I, I think he would have done a pretty bang up job. Uh between him and Demetrius, who had the nickname the Besieger for a reason. Yeah. And Even though I, the last siege of his life he failed on with at Athens, uh, but whatever. Uh, I think that he was I, named after Rhodes. I think that it definitely would have given us a very different history. I think that like the famous like stuff of like Pyrrhus of Ephorus, um, probably would not have like basically ever become like as famous as he is because he probably would have still been fighting for the Macedonian mm -hmm. like the Antigonids. Yeah. Um, I think that I don't. For think the Antigonids that did hold the crown of Macedonia until Roman occupation. Yeah, that is true. And I do. I think that the Antigonids probably never would have actually tried to in invade Italy. I think. I don't think that. I probably would have been, had their hands tied up trying to defend Greece from Roman inc in incursions. But I don't know how the Roman incursions probably would have taken longer. Because, but the biggest reason why 
the Romans went to Greece in the first place was because they wanted to fight against the Macedonians who had allied themselves with Carthage. But, I mean, that could lead us to a whole different thing if the Antigonids were actually had large amounts of power, though. Mm -hmm. um, they were a conquering only, force, not an occupying force. Yeah, we can only guess what would have happened. But, I mean, there's so much complexities in this, this era that... Especially it, after years and years of conquering, administering an empire is, well, a hell of a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And I think that's... I mean, obviously, Alexander didn't really live long enough, but I think that he had he even... Basically, Alexander's entire life was based off of conquering. I mean, he had plans to conquer all of Arabia. He had plans to conquer... To have an invasion of Carthage. Like, this man, all he thought about was he wanted to conquer the rest of India. Like, he... Yeah. He basically... I, I think that his empire would have been extremely poorly run under Alexander because he basically had nothing... He did nothing but, but conquer. And... Um, the Greeks themselves, you know, they had their kind of like, they're like, oh, barbaros, like these people are inferior. I don't want to interact with them sort of thing. And they definitely wouldn't have wanted to like rule the, the mm. territory themselves. So it's like, I think that it's really one of those things where it's just, I think the, the whole thing was doomed from the start. And yeah. Hello. I think we should start segueing. Here. Yeah, we should, we should segue. And so we're going to segue into the next period and we're going to talk about, um, Rome, which this comes pretty much right after. So we're going <laughs> to segue into Rome. We'll give a quick um, intro to that. Um, yeah. What do you, let's, I mean, fall of the Republic. So the Republic has existed officially for, I mean, if you want to go by the Roman Republic, which is what, like at this point, like 600 years, but it was but it 700. Has. But I mean, at this point. Closer probably to one or 200 years. But yeah, I mean, this, the Roman Republic as like a major power <coughs> basically it was arising at this, at yeah. this same era. And they had fought wars against the Carthaginians. The Greek Etruscans. Was, yeah, they had defeated the Etruscans first. They defeated the Samnites. Um, they took over basically Italy. And they defeated, well, they didn't defeat him like in battle, but they managed to hold out against Pyrrhus's invasion. Mm -hmm. And Pyrrhus got distracted doing other stuff and then, you know, died by taking a roof tablet to his head in um, Greece. And then was That's beheaded. how it goes. That's how it goes. It's how all famous generals die, apparently. But. <laughs> He, um, the Romans would defeat the Carthaginians three times. They'd burn the city of Carthage. And at this time, they were probably the most powerful faction in the, world. In the Mediterranean, at least, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And they, they, had, they yeah. were still a republic, though. But things were getting pretty close. There was a lot of instability growing in Rome. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't had, like, any... They, up until this point, they hadn't basically had any internal problems. Or at least, like, stru like internal problems that could lead to civil war until until this point and until we get to the sola which i don't i don't know if you want to talk a little bit about about sola it will be in the documentary yeah. but you can give a little bit of, do you know anything about sola lucius cornelius well. sola he is the first um or the first famous dictator of rome that defeated marius and took over Mar he marched his army into rome basically they told him and he want, he hey, break the thing up before you get past the Rubicon. Yeah. He marched his army into Rome, and he ousted all... He, he was actually in favor of the Senate, which is actually a funny thing. He, he wanted to... He marched his army into Rome because he wanted to maintain the power of, like, the aristocracy of the Senate. Yeah. And when he went on to campaign, the Senate was like, you know, we like our position, but we'd want to be... We don't want a dictator, like, protecting us. We want to have the power. So they turned on him, and they actually called back his rival... And, but we'll, that will be in the documentary. So we, we'll, we'll just segue into that. We'll talk about it at the end. So hit, hit us with the, with the Rome documentary now. Hit <laughs> it. Follow the Roman Republic. Let's roll it. Calvatone, northern Italy. This is the site of the old Roman village of Bedriaco. Hi, I'm Adam Moran. In 69 AD, two separate battles would take place here at Bedriaco between three men fighting to become emperor of Rome. The Empire was once again in a state of civil war in the latest round of internal conflict. For roughly the last 150 years or so, Rome has been stricken with relatively constant infighting and struggle that would bring the final collapse of the Old Republic and bring rise to an empire. Now, you'll get to witness the various battles and conflicts that took place in the waning days of the Republic and during the turmoil of the first imperial dynastic transition in the year of the four emperors. See the vast numbers of soldiers their formations, and the context and history of the engagements, now on Decisive Era. To 
fully see how Rome was once again plunged into turmoil, we must go back over 150 years before Bedriacum to Rome's first real civil war in 88 BCE between Lucius Cornelius Sulla and Gaius Marius. Marius was an experienced general who had gained prominence in his campaigns in Africa and during the Social War. He was also famous for his military reforms that allowed non-property-owning Romans to join the military, allowing it to become a career rather than a duty. Sulla was also a great general who would also fight in the Social War and in Africa, and in 88 BCE he would be given the consulship. But mobs supporting Marius forced him to flee to Greece where he would gather his army and enter Rome by force and force Marius into exile. As Sulla returned to the east on campaign, the Senate would turn on him, granting consulships to Marius and his ally Cena in 87 BCE. But Marius would die less than three weeks into his consulship, and Cena would later be killed by mutinous soldiers, prompting Sulla to once again return to Rome. BCE, Sulla would once again march on Rome, defeating Marius the Younger and the rest of his supporters by 80 BCE. He'd be reinstated as dictator of Rome and execute most of his enemies, but his reign would be short-lived as he would resign the following year. After Sulla's resignation from the dictatorship, the Roman Republic would seemingly be spared for the time being. Over a decade later, the Republic would avoid another potential disaster in 63 BCE as Cicero would foil the Catiline conspiracy, resulting in the execution of most of the conspirators. For the time being, it seemed the Roman Republic would be spared, but another conflict was ordered to Rome. By 60 BCE, the first triumvirate would be formed between three of the most powerful men in Rome, Julius Caesar, Pompeius Magnus, and Licinius Crassus. The three would use their power and influence to circumvent various constitutional and senatorial obstacles. Crassus was the richest man in Rome, who had also gained military prominence in his victory against Spartacus. Pompey was considered to be the greatest general in Rome at the time for his various victories in Iberia and in the east against Mithridates and the Cilician pirates. Caesar, on the other hand, was a young and rising commander. He would be given command in Gaul, where he'd fight for many years, defeating various tribes and bringing Roman rule. Disaster would strike the first triumvirate, as Caesar's daughter Julia, who was married to Pompey, would die in 54 BCE. Even worse, Crassus would be decisively defeated by the Parthians at Carrhae in 53 BCE, resulting in his death. This would officially end the first triumvirate, leaving only Caesar and Pompey to face each other. Caesar's many victories in Gaul had made him extraordinarily popular, especially with his soldiers and the people. This would prompt Pompey to oppose Caesar in the Senate, resulting in them becoming rivals. By 49 BCE, Caesar had conquered all of Gaul, but he refused to release his legions, and the Senate declared him an enemy of Rome. Rather than surrender, he took the 13th legion and marched it into Italy. Caesar was loved by his soldiers, and they were willing to do almost anything for him. In 49 BCE, this loyalty would be displayed as Caesar would lead the 13th legion over the Rubicon into Italy. This would catch Pompey and the Senate completely off guard, as they had no legions to defend Rome. They would abandon the city to Caesar, retreating south and eventually to Greece. A four-year civil war would begin, as Caesar would follow Pompey into Greece. Pompey would initially seem to have the upper hand once he had gathered his legions. But in 48 BCE, they would meet at Pharsalus. Both Caesar and Pompey would bring roughly eight legions to bear against one another. But Caesar's legions were severely under strength, and he only had 22,000 men and 1,000 cavalry. Against him, Pompey's full strength legion of 36,000 legionaries and 7,000 cavalry. Pompey would organize his legions.
legions in a traditional triple line Roman formation. But Caesar would have to stretch his men thin in order to match the full length of Pompey's army. He'd also create a fourth line in hopes of countering Pompey's overwhelming cavalry number. There was a large distance between the two armies, and Pompey would hold his position, ordering his men not to advance. This would force Caesar to charge on Pompey. As the battle would begin, Pompey's overwhelming cavalry numbers would push back Caesar's cavalry. But then, Caesar's fourth line would hold the cavalry at bay, and in fact, force them to rout. Caesar's remaining cavalry would flank around Pompey's army, and his battle-hardened veterans would break Pompey's left wing, which would flee the battle, causing mass panic. Caesar would win a great victory and take very few casualties. Caesar would pursue Pompey to Egypt, but when he got there, he would find that he was already dead. At Pharsalus, Pompey would be decisively defeated by Caesar, and he would barely escape with his life. He would attempt to flee to Egypt, but as he arrived, he'd be executed under orders of Ptolemy the 13th. To Ptolemy's surprise, this would deeply anger Caesar. And in fact, he would aid the Queen Cleopatra in her civil war against him. After his stay in Egypt, Caesar would continue his campaign against the remaining Pompeians, defeating Scipio at the Battle of Thapsus in North Africa in 46 BCE. Caesar would become dictator for life, but he was extremely lenient to most of his enemies. However, this may have resulted in his downfall, as in 44 BCE, he would be assassinated and one of the conspirators would be his forgiven friend, Brutus. The conspirators, led by Brutus and Cassius, had hoped to liberate the Republic, but to their surprise, they had only enraged the people, as well as Caesar's adopted son and heir, Octavian, and his friend and general, Mark Antony. Brutus and Cassius would flee to the east, but they would be given time, as initially, Mark Antony and Octavian would turn against one another. However, the two would reunite along with Lepidus to form the Second Triumvirate, as reports of Brutus and Cassius's growing number of legions came in. In 42 BCE, the Triumvirs under Octavian and Mark Antony would face off against the Liberators, led by Brutus and Cassius at the Battle of Philippi. As many as 200,000 men would fight to decide the final fate of the old Roman Republic. The two massive armies would collide. Antony would face off against Cassius, and Octavian would face off against Brutus. Octavian's legions would be pushed back by Brutus, but on the other side, Antony would push back Cassius. And upon hearing a false report that Brutus had been defeated, Cassius would commit suicide. Brutus was able to rally Cassius's legions before chaos could ensue, and an orderly retreat was maintained. On October 23rd, the two armies would once again face off against each other. Brutus's attack was repulsed, resulting in a terrible slaughter. Thousands would die, and most of his men would rout in confusion. As Octavian and Antony's forces neared Brutus's camp, he would retreat with his remaining legions to nearby hills, but after realizing that victory was impossible, he would commit suicide. The Liberators had been decisively defeated at Philippi, with the remaining Republicans being relegated to Sicily and the surrounding waters. The last remaining Republicans, led by Sextus Pompeius, the son of Pompey, would be defeated by 36 BCE, as Lepidus and Octavian would lead their forces into Sicily. The following year, Sextus would be captured and executed, officially ending Republican resistance. The new triumvirate would now control Rome, but the peace would not last long, as Lepidus would be pushed out of the alliance, and Octavian and Antony would renew their former conflict. With Mark Antony in the east and Octavian in the west, the last civil war of the Roman Republic would begin in 32 BCE. Octavian had been looking for an excuse to declare war on Antony, and would use Antony's affair with Cleopatra to fuel a propaganda campaign against him. Along with this, Octavian would illegally seize Antony's will, reading it to the Senate and accusing him of anti-Roman sentiment. 
Octavian urged the Senate to declare war on Cleopatra, as he knew Antony would come to her aid. When he did, the Senate stripped Antony of all of his power and labeled him a traitor to Rome. Both Octavian and Antony would raise their legions, each mustering over 200,000 men. In 31 BCE, Octavian and Antony would meet at Actium in a massive naval battle. Over 700 ships would be involved, and Antony would personally lead his fleet into battle. However, he would be defeated by Octavian's forces and forced to retreat. Antony would retreat to North Africa, leaving a majority of his legions stuck in Greece without supplies, where they would surrender soon after. The legions Antony hoped to raise in North Africa had switched sides and joined Octavian, forcing him to retreat to Egypt. Antony would gather his last remaining 30,000 men and attempt to defeat the traitor, but his army was destroyed and he was forced once again to retreat to Egypt before Octavian arrived to besiege Alexandria. Realizing the situation was hopeless, Antony would commit suicide in August of 30 BCE. Not soon after, Cleopatra would also commit suicide after a failed attempt to surrender. After Actium and the suicide of Antony and Cleopatra, there was no one left to stand in Octavian's way. He became master of Rome and proclaimed Augustus, and he became the first emperor of the new Roman Empire. As the sole ruler of Rome, Augustus would transform the Old Republic into the Roman Empire by 27 BCE. At long last, relative peace and stability were brought to Rome, but this would not last long as Augustus's heirs were not as capable as he was at managing the empire. Tiberius would be unpopular with the Senate, and his heir, Caligula, would go mad and be assassinated. After that, Claudius would be murdered by poison in October of 54 AD, potentially by his wife, Agrippina. His heir, Nero, would become the last emperor of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Nero would become extremely unpopular, characterized as being extraordinarily cruel. He would put almost all of his enemies to death, including his mother. Over 13 years into his reign, he would be declared an enemy of Rome and replaced by Emperor Galba, and in 68 AD, he would commit suicide. A new round of Roman civil war would emerge, known as the Year of the Four Emperors. The legions of Germania would revolt, declaring Vitellius the emperor, and another opponent named Otho would bribe the Praetorian Guard to kill Galba and would be proclaimed emperor by the Senate. Otho hoped to make peace with Vitellius, who had rebelled against the now dead emperor Galba. This was impossible, however, and the two would meet in battle at Bedriacum in April. Otho would be defeated, either dying in battle or committing suicide. Vitellius would be next to be declared emperor. However, he proved to be extremely violent, killing large numbers of his enemies and rivals as Rome fell into massive debt. However, the civil war would continue as the legions of the eastern provinces who had been fighting in Judea declared Vespasian emperor. Vitellius had made many enemies, and Vespasian was also able to turn the Danube legions to his side. In October of 69 AD, Vespasian's forces would defeat Vitellius, ironically at Bedriacum, the same place he had previously defeated Otho. By the end of the year, Vespasian's forces assaulted Rome, catching Vitellius as they tried to escape and executing him. The new Flavian dynasty would rise under Vespasian, who had now become master of Rome. The year of the four emperors was finally over, and for the time being, the civil wars that had ravaged Rome for over a century had come to a close. Stability was brought back to the Roman Empire after a year of turmoil and chaos, and for over the next 100 years, 
world would reach a state of relative internal peace and stability until the death of Commodus in 192 would bring the next round of internal struggle and civil war. All right, we're back. Last of our prereqs, so yeah, that let's was, talk this. Let's talk through. Keep on their merry way. Yeah, let's talk through the, the fall of the Roman Republic and the subsequent civil wars afterwards. <laughs> or a lot of civil wars. I think that documentary covered four. <laughs> so. All we need to do is know how to discuss it. Um, it is such a war of triumphs. Exactly. Um, I, I guess we can also make a quick correction. Technically speaking, Otho definitely committed suicide, but um, there was already a lot of suicide. <laughs> and taking historical liberties in your documentary. Yeah, there was already a lot of suicide <laughs> and um, assassinations in the documentary, and I was like, you know, we should do something slightly different. <laughs> so Otho, <laughs> I mean, he might have. I mean, he died like right after the battle. Like he based they like. The, the, the soldier's blood wasn't even dry before he killed himself. But, I mean, so he died in battle. He... By self-inflicted wounds. Yeah, by, by self-inflicted wounds, exactly. That, that's a perfect way of putting it. But, yeah, so th this was a, obviously a, you can go into he, it. He uh, did a race. <laughs> yeah, he, he went on live. He realized that he, he was done for. <laughs> but is your, um, your mic not working? Is it on? Are we working? Working. All right. I'm going to keep talking while Cameron, um, I guess, fixes the mic. But so this was clearly a very hectic time for, for Rome. Um, the Republic um, was basically coming to a close. This had been, the, the decline had been happening for, for a while now. And um, after, after Sulla, basically seized Rome. He didn't actually do very, very much. He, he died pretty much after he seized Rome for like the second time. And, <coughs> and that was pretty much it. And, and okay, fair. Okay, Cameron's going to go grab another pair of batteries. But, so. Air three. <laughs> but, exactly. Yeah, if you did hear what Cameron said. He said that um, he's going through batteries like Rome goes through emperors in 69 AD. <laughs> but, <laughs> that is unfortunately true. <laughs> but <laughs> so basically at this point, um, after Sulla basically died, the the Senate thought that, oh, we're all good and dandy. We're just gonna go back to, you know, we're gonna go back to the way it was and we're gonna have no problems whatsoever. And oh boy, were they wrong. They were followed by a conspiracy and which, you know, further weakened the republic. And at this point, the Republic was 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 done for. It was, it was waiting for it was waiting for a disaster, and so the tr the triumvirate would basically be formed at this point between Crassus Caesar and and Pompey the Great. And after the death of one member, you can't you can't have three to balance each other out because one of them can never become too powerful because because then the other two will will fight against him. But as soon as there's two, um, one has to only one can remain basically. And that's essentially what happened. And there was a bunch of political maneuvering behind the scenes, but eventually um, Caesar would find an excuse to, to, attack, to attack Rome. And he'd take Rome after Pompey and the Senate would retreat to Greece, mm -hmm. right? And you want to go from, from there a bit quickly? And just from well, just what happened when well, Caesar chased after him. Uh, Caesar chased after Pompey, and Pompey, he heads down to uh, Egypt. After well, he lost at Pharsalus. At Pharsalus, yep. He heads on down to Egypt. He arrives in the port. He's like, hey, boys. So you're the guys who pay for some passage, right? And they're like, yeah. And then they cut his head off and gave it to Caesar as a gift. And Caesar's like, why would I want that? It's yeah. that part in uh, Wayne's World where it's like, I have a gift. And he goes, if it's a severed head, I will be very upset. <laughs> yeah, Caesar got pretty mad. And we don't actually know because 
Caesar, we don't know how much like Caesar like. He, it's very likely that Caesar probably did respect Pompey as a rival. Like even if he didn't like. Yeah, that's they, your boy. They, they were they had fought together. They had I mean his Caesar's daughter was literally married to Pompey. So they if nothing else he definitely respected it. And to he he probably intended to kill him himself if we're being completely honest. But to basically have what he believed as as foreigners hand him the head of his of a Roman rival he thought of and someone they killed under less than honest means. Yeah, because he because Pompey was under the impression that he was he was going to be able to go grant there. asylum. Yeah, and so he definitely um, was not very happy with that, and and he he actually joined the civil war that was going on there between ptolemy i don't remember which one but he was ptolemy after the 10th he was he was he was deep into the the ptolemaic dynasty here this is his follow this they is, went through ptolemy it's like for the french go through louis yeah he was he was he was way down there um he was the he was the incestuous descendant of the original ptolemy because all those greek <laughs> successors wanted to do in egypt was keep the bloodlines <coughs> but he'd fight against his sister cleopatra and he'd be drowned in a river and that's how Ptolemy, the last Ptolemy died. And Caesar would have a, a, a son with Cleopatra, and then he'd go to fight the rest of the senators that had, that had, you know, gone in their own separate ways, I guess. And then, but I guess we, and this is basically what the documentary has already covered. So I guess we can go mostly to like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, what do you have? Uh, we can talk about, you know, I guess alternate history. So what do you think? Do you think Caesar was? I mean. He technically never declared himself emperor. Caesar, he, he but do you Just think a little he would, dictator for life? Yeah, do you actually. think he would have headed in that direction? Do you think he would have made a good first emperor of Rome? What do you think? I about think Caesar? in all but name, he was the first emperor of Rome. I I, I, I agree with that. Uh, Augustus, of course, has the title first emperor. Found Rome a city of brick, left the city of marble. But at the same time, it's Caesar. Yeah. See, I mean, most people literally think that Caesar was the first. I mean, Caesar's name. Well, well, Caesar's Augustus is technically the term. I mean, everyone is like Caesar because of like, and I mean, he just even handed down to like the Germans. Caesar, Caesar, yeah, Caesar, Czar, yeah, all of. But Caesar was technically, you know, it's a title. But Augustus was technically with the name that they give themselves as emperor. Every Roman emperor, all the way till the Byzantines and the. Eastern oh, but they Roman called emperor. them Basilius. Yeah, they, they got to the Byzantines because that was going back to Greece because the Greeks called their kings Basilius. Yeah, but they would give themselves like. Like during, gosh, what was his name? Like Honor, uh, um, Honorius, and um, his brother Arcadius in the late Roman Empire. They were the children of, <coughs> bless you, are descendants of um, Theodosius in the the far far late Roman Empire. This is near their collapse. Um, they were called Augustus as emperor, mm -hmm. and so it, it was the title of of the emperor. But Caesar, I mean, most people. Probably know who Caesar is more than they know who Octavian is, I mean, yeah. or, or Augustus. Believe it or not, because he's just he's just so basically in, ingrained into the culture. Yeah. Just, I mean, there's a pizza restaurant named after him for Pete's sake, but <laughs> but <laughs> time but is ready. Do you think that Do you think that he would have made a like? A, I mean, he was an emperor in all but name. But do you think he would have been able to? Would you think he would have made a good emperor had he not been, you know, killed? Well, yeah. Uh, if magically the Senate somehow liked him, certainly. Uh, Do you think he'd been better than uh, than, uh, than Augustus? No. You don't think so? Oh, no. I, I think Augustus was one hell of an emperor. Yeah, Augustus. I mean, I mean, he literally built the system that only basically he could run, mm -hmm. and he. Augustus just had one of those political minds like Bismarck, where you can take, you can study it for years and years and years and never kind of come up, keep coming up short to it. Exactly. Yeah. I guess Augustus definitely, I mean, with all of his, you know, I guess, psychotic things that he did, he's definitely was not a good first emperor. It oh, was, no, none of them are. He was insane. None, yeah, yeah, Caesar was a genocide of man. Yeah, yeah, they, were, they, were, they all were, exactly. <laughs> they what were. happened to the Gauls? <laughs> um, Made room nothing for the good. Nothing good. <laughs> but yeah, for sure, 100%. Like, I mean, you basically cannot find a good, like, I mean, I mean probably the best. Roman Emperor in terms of being a person was probably like what Marcus Aurelius and like oh yeah and he was probably like but his whole philosophy was not giving a damn yeah exactly so I mean man invented stoicism it's pretty hard to find like an, an a ruler from antiquity uh, antiquity geez, um, antiquity or even like the later like the later eras after that that is like you know a genuinely good I guess human being but Augustus was definitely I'll throw a good rule. I'll tr throw Trajan into the ring there though yeah I'd say that. Augustus definitely knew what he was doing. I'd say that he was def probably better 
than Alexander the Great, if I'm being completely oh, yeah. honest. Maybe, maybe administering, yeah. He would, but, but even though Alexander took the Persian system, slapped yeah. his name on it, and said, "We rocking." Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't think that Augustus was good at like conquering because he himself didn't really do a lot of the general. He like, basically left that to other people. That, but he understood. Well, fair, he had his military time. He was at Actium. Yeah, but under, he, but he didn't lead military. the battle of Actium. Didn't lead the it battle. Was act, it was actually, um, what, what, I believe, what was his name, um, Agrippa. Yeah. Would go to the, but would that, if, if nothing else, credit give credit where credit's due. He he knew what basically what his shortcomings were and put people that were better at in certain areas than him in those places. So whether whether he was the greatest general of all time, he probably he wasn't. He wasn't that great of a general. He probably he wasn't as good as Mark Antony. He wasn't as strong as as Mark Antony as his rival. Basically, he was. There ain't no Ulysses S. Grant. Yeah, but he he knew how to put people in places that were, and. And they did the job for him. And yeah. but he. And that's what. But administering yes, that's something that I believe Alexander probably could have never done on account of his own giant ego. Yes, yeah. and I, and I don't think that. I mean, Alexander might have been able to. I mean, he might be, if he had lived till eighty, like Antigonus, he may have been able to. Um, he could have conquered that. the world. He could have conquered India. He could have, if his obviously his troops were magically, you know, willing Replenished. to replenish. Yeah, and willing blood to lusted for the next fifty he, years. He probably he had. Especially with the technology at the time, because at this point Rome had not, you know, was not a power, or a major power, and they, they didn't have like a counter to the Macedonian phalanx. He very, very likely could have defeated the rest of India, defeated the or the, the various Arabian tribes, maybe even defeated Carthage. But I just, once all is said and once the dust settles, I just Alexander's empire was was basically doomed to fail because he himself. And his, his his generals didn't like him at this point. His army didn't like him, and he didn't know how to run an empire. He was he was his he, the best chance that he had was basically to just copy the Persian system. And I don't even know if he would have done that. Mm -hmm. So, but um, I guess we can uh, go up to Augustus. I mean, well, we were talking about Augustus, right? So we have talk about Caesar. Do you think that? Um, I mean, we talk we talk about Caesar and whether he would have been a good emperor. I think he would have also been a pretty good emperor though i mean he also you know did his own you know murdering all of his opponents yeah. thing but i mean that's pretty common I, that's, that's a big <laughs> rome that's a big antiquity thing mm -hmm. you don't really have amicable rivals yeah how do you feel about all the roman emperors being assassinated by the praetorian guard i can't remember what the percentage is but i think it's like geez like i think it's like 20 or something emperors i i can try to quickly look it up but it's basically like um imagine if like the Secret Service decided yeah, who was president based on who paid them the most. Yeah, and imagine if the Secret Service also killed, like, out of the four, like the 40 or so presidents we've had. Imagine if he killed, um, if the Secret Service was responsible for death of, like, seven or eight presidents. Like, that's insane. Yeah. Like, you probably wouldn't want to be president, which is, which is one of the things that, like, they actually talk about. Like, lots of Roman emperors had, like, major problems with, um, like, they were, they were constantly, like, um, what's it, paranoid, basically. Yeah. And, but is it really paranoia if everyone's actually out to get you? Because everyone was definitely out to get They're all in the those walls. people. Yeah. <laughs> they were after them, and they were definitely going to kill them, as, oh, yeah. as is shown. Because I don't think you can look at like the list, and I, I think that the amount of Roman emperors that died of natural causes is like five. <laughs> like, I don't think that uh, almost any Roman emperors died. Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. Augustus. Um, Tiberius? Tiberius did die of natural causes, too. But I mean, you've got like you've got so many good Caligula, yeah, and murdered Claudius, poisoned Nero, killed himself, and that's just the Julio Claudian dynasty. Yeah, it's, they couldn't even make it out of the first dynasty of Rome without sixty percent of the emperors not dying of natural causes. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, just I mean, that's literally what Rome is. This like it, I I don't think it's even you can even say it's really paranoia if if. If you have a higher chance of being killed or dying unnaturally than you do of, you know, dying of old age in your bed. So So remember the Praetorian Guard are living in your walls and they're coming for you. Yeah. Don't don't let the Praetorian Guard get you. All right. We about ready but, to close this out, you think? Um Yeah, what do you what do you think? I mean we <laughs> let's go all the way to Aurelian. <laughs> <laughs> quick quick rundown of Aurelian before we wrap up. Aurelian <laughs> was a basically a dude. He was a general, was a commoner. A, a dude. Uh, and he was he came power in the the the, war, in the the third century crisis and Rome was crumbling and they the Romans at this time probably thought that this was the end of the world and 
The, for the, them, it was. Yeah, for that, for them, it was. The Gallic Empire had split off. Palmyra had split off under Queen Zenobia, and um, the Fun world, name. The, yeah, the world was crumbling. The, the the Sassanid Persian Empire was was fighting the Palmyrans, and and Aurelian suddenly came to power, and uh, and he he reunited the entire empire on his lonesome. He just defeated all of them. Defeated Zenobia twice. Reunited the Gallic Empire with the Roman Empire, and then. He was assassinated accidentally by his own troops because there was a plot against him because he was a commoner by some soldiers. Mm -hmm. And his soldiers, some of his like loyal soldiers, were like, you know, we should protect, you know, the greatest emperor we've had in a really long time. This dude who actually deserves the title. Exactly. And they were like, so at night, they were like, you know, we're going to go kill these, um, these traitors and we're going to... And so they went out to do that and they made a bunch of noise, right? And the Emperor Aurelian heard the commotion and he got out of his tent and he was like what's going on here and his soldiers thought that Aurelian was one of the people that they were trying to kill and they stabbed him to death allegedly which sounds like a very convenient story for them want just killing Aurelian and being like we th we thought he was one of the bad guys yeah so yeah. the story goes that I either they were trying to kill him for some reason or they were just absolutely incompetent but they accidentally killed the greatest emperor one of the greatest emperors of Roman history in general, but at mm -hmm. the, definitely at the time, the savior of Rome, and plunged the empire into more civil wars afterwards. And that's just one of, you know, the 50,000 civil wars that Rome had. So I guess we'll leave it there um, with Emperor Aurelian getting killed by his own soldiers accidentally at the night. Yeah, and here's to next time. Here's the next time. Thank you for joining us. I had a blast, Cameron. Hell yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. All righty. All right, we rocking. Until next time, we're going to clean up the set now. <laughs> All right. <laughs>